Thank you, Claire, for the very kind introduction. And uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming over. Um, as Claire mentioned, this is a topical um, title. And as a result, I've never given this talk previously, so I hope it won't be too clunky and that, that will uh, excite you. So first of all, before we get started, I think you have to agree on what I mean by light rechargeable battery. Um, and that's the reason I've taken this picture here as a background. So if you look at this picture, this is a solar farm installed by Tesla on the island of Kauai, which is up in the Pacific, in the Hawaii Islands. You can see the, the solar panels on the background, and then the white blocks in the front are batteries that are used to store the solar energy um, when the sun doesn't shine, so you can still provide um, energy to the end users. So the idea of a light rechargeable battery is to merge these two devices together. So in other, in other words, the solar cell and the battery become one, and the same material will harvest the sun's energy and store it at the same time. And so hopefully doing this, it will be able to save cost because you don't have to build both solar cells and batteries. And hopefully those devices will also be more compact and user friendly. So I don't think I need to um, spend many slides on explaining why we need to find new solutions for our energy problems. I'll just use this one slide, um, which is taken from the IPCC's study on what would happen if the global climate temperature raises by 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. And um, what this graph shows is that we're on route to disaster. So this graph shows um, the temperature increments um, that we've seen compared to pre-industrial levels on the vertical axis and then timeline on the horizontal axis. And so according to this graph, by 2040, if we don't change anything, we'll hit a temperature rise of 1.5 degrees. And if we do that, the results would be that um, the climate disasters we've been experiencing, like the floods you've seen in Australia the past weeks, um, uh, the Eunice uh, storm that uh, went over the UK a few weeks ago, the fires that's been happening in California will intensify and become more frequent. Um, as a result, sort of the impact on farming, damage to infrastructure, and all these things would be obviously disastrous. So in order to avoid this from happening, what needs to happen is that by uh, 2055, at the latest, we need to be net zero, and then we might just be able to avoid uh, this disaster. Now, in terms of renewable energy sources, solar energy has been studied for a very long time. And the reason is clear. If you look at this graph, which shows uh, the daily insulation, you can see that in, in large parts of the world, uh, about seven kilowatts hour um, are collected per square meter per day on the surface. And so if you would be able to capture just a fraction of a percent of this energy, all our energy problems would be solved. Now, obviously, there's a couple of problems with uh, uh, sun energy. There's not as much in the north, for instance, where we live. And also, obviously, at night, there's no sunlight. And so we need to find a solution to both harvest energy, but also to store it. Now, with the pressing climate changes and um, the urgent solution to uh, solve these, one might ask themselves the question, is there still time to develop new solutions, or should we just deploy what we have today? And actually, the International Energy Agency predicts that um, by 2050, half of the reduction in emissions will come from technologies that are still being developed in the labs today. So still developing new technologies is really key to advert um, climate disaster. So now let's start thinking about how we could use solar energy uh, more efficiently. And sort of it's interesting to go back uh, to the past and see where these ideas came from. And interestingly, back by the, at the end of the 19th century, um, engineers like Augustin Mouchot were already thinking of ways to capture solar energy and store it. And so at the time, what they were using was uh, using these um, troughs, which are reflective, and then they had sort of pressure vessels generating steam, which was at the time the best way to sort of capture energy. 
And actually, in descriptions of these experiments, the people uh, standing by were sort of very worried about uh, the pressure kettle being about to explode because of all the heat generated and so on. So the French ministry um, was interested in this invention at first, but then after a while they decided that this was a technical success, but a practical failure. And so it was called a failure because by the time um, this uh, invention came about, France had uh, secured very good deals with England actually to um, import a lot of very cheap coal, which solved all their energy problems at the time. But it's very interesting to think of what might have happened if the French government had thought differently and had sort of commercialized this technology. Um, if that would have happened, maybe we would have seen many more of these solar power towers like the one here being developed in the Nevada desert, um, and so which is sort of a scaled up version of this early day invention to um, uh, capture solar energy. And actually this project unfortunately was stopped just a year or two ago uh, during the pandemic and so it's unclear whether that's due to the pandemic or more um, technical issues. I think there were problems with seals and others in this um, development. And so in the near future, it's much more likely that our solar energy will be stored as follows. Uh, so this is a picture again from Tesla where they are using solar tiles to harvest sun's energy and they're using the Tesla batteries here on the side to store the energy. And so in this picture, it seems very simple and clean and zen. But if you look into the wiring that goes with this, it's actually quite complicated as a technology. You need a lot of power inverters and, and controllers to make sure that sort of the energy generated by the sun is converted to the right voltage for um, charging your batteries, as well as sending energy back to the net and so on. So it's all quite complicated. And, depending on the sources you read up. Um, actually, in these solar solutions, 40% uh, of the cost can go to the batteries and the inverters and so on. And so if we can get rid of that cost, that would obviously be uh, a big benefit. So the question at hand is, can we merge the solar cells with these batteries in one simple device that just directly harvests the sun's light to first and for all reduce cost but also make um, the whole system more compact. So as you might uh, have read about uh, the uh, Internet of Things and smart cities and so on, what people are very keen to have more of are these real smart systems where you have a sensor with a little antenna and a little energy um, power supply um, that could be distributed over cities and could be used in farms and other places. And of course, these are very compact and certainly for those kind of applications, having a very um, miniaturized energy harvesting and storage device would be exciting as well. So to talk a bit more about why we want to develop solar batteries. So first of all, I gave the example of this house here, which has solar panel, its roofs and then batteries on the side. We could ask ourselves whether that's a good idea. Um, and if you read up on the UK government's net zero strategy for the UK, they emphasize as one of their key goals to deploy more low cost solar energy as well as decentralized renewables generation and storage. Um, so certainly for the UK, this is, according to the government, an important strategy. It's interesting to note that they emphasize low cost there's no mention of higher efficiency or so it's all bringing the cost down is their main um, goal. And also, you know, the uh, UK government has, has uh, identified a number of grand challenges, one of which is the clean growth. And within this challenge, they identified that buildings must become more energy efficient. And of course, if the building can um, harvest some of the energy needs it has, that would be helping uh, to meet these goals. Then the second important area of application that I foresee for solar batteries is the Internet of Things. Just as I explained in the previous slide, having very small sort of sensors with their own energy harvesting and storage um, solution would be very interesting. So this picture is taken from a paper where they talk about a farm that will have sort of these sensors on their livestock, uh, in their orchard in this case, and, and so on and so forth. And this all need to be uh, autonomous and need that for solar energy harvesting and storage. Then thirdly, 
a grand challenge we are facing as a society is energy poverty. So uh, the seventh uh, UN Sustainable Development Goal is to um, develop more affordable and reliable energy sources. So there's about 760 million people around the world who lack access to uh, sustainable energy and finding a solution for this is really important. Um, when people don't have access to clean energy, they rely on um, fuels that are oftentimes unsustainable because they come from deforestation, but also they oftentimes burned indoors in um, conditions where there's not good aeration, uh, sorry, not good ventilation. And actually people, uh, a very substantial amount of people die every year just because they burn um, uh, fuels in their homes. And um, the UN's um, roadmap for 2030 is to triple um, the, the global renewable energy capacity and certainly finding uh, local solutions for this is uh, important. And finally, I won't spend too much time on this last picture, but I think it's become very clear to many people in recent weeks that we really have to think about our dependence on uh, fossil fuel sources. Great. Um, so I think in, in the rest of the slides, I'll, I'll be mainly focusing on energy poverty. Part of this is um, the reason I just explained with people dying because of um, no, having no access to clean energy sources. Also, if you overlay the map of the areas that suffer most from um, energy poverty, indicated in dark red here, and you overlay that with where there's most insulation, so most energy of the sun per square meter, you see that there's a very good match between the dark red regions on those two maps, so they, they seem to uh, geographically coincide quite nicely. Great, so I think it's time to uh, dive a little bit more in how batteries and solar cells operate and then figure out whether we can merge the two functionalities so that we can bring down costs. Um, so this is a cross-section of a battery electrode. So at the top you have an anode, at the bottom a cathode, and those two electrodes are separated, so they're kept apart by a membrane which is soaked in an electrolyte. And so importantly, ions can go back and forth between the anode and the cathode through the electrolyte, but electrons count, so the electrons are forced to go round circuit, as I'll explain in a second. When your battery is charged, lithium ions, in the case of lithium ion battery, are pulled out of the cathode and are stored in the anode. I'll explain in just a moment how we do that. So these lithium ions are very unhappy in the anode. Um, they want to go back to the cathode to reduce the Gibbs free energy of the system. Right? So you pull them out of equilibrium and there's the Gibbs free energy pulling them back in the cathode. And so as I just mentioned, the lithium ions can go through the separator, but the electrons count. And so they are forced to go through an external circuit where they can uh, power a, a light or a laptop or whatever it is, and then they join the ion to keep um, uh, charge neutrality. So then after a while, all your lithium ions have gone to the cathode and your battery is flat. Then what you do is you apply an external current which pulls the electron which was here up there, and the ion needs to follow and goes back to the anode and now your battery is recharged and you're back at square one. That makes sense. So I like to make an analogy with people, really. Um, so, um, you know, people will go to uh, uh, their work if they are paid enough, but it's not their energetically favorable place to be. As soon as they get a chance, they want to go back to their homes to, uh, to have fun with their friends or watch TV or whatever it is. And uh, in this case, there's a two-body problem where, you know, the two identities travel to certain different paths. And it's important to keep that in mind, ions and electrons have to travel differently. And so if you pay these people enough, they will go back to their work and they go back there and now your battery is recharged, so to speak. Now what we are trying to uh, investigate here with a photo battery, a light rechargeable battery, is where there are other ways to incentivize people to go to work without using money. And sort of some people are rewarded by, you know, winning prizes or other things and that would sort of promote them to be up there. And we'll try to do that with light in our batteries. And it's another way to bring some people to the energetically highest state after which it would um, come back down to discharge the battery. So what would light charging look like in a battery? 
So imagine that you have a material here, which is a semiconductor, which has a band gap. Um, I won't go into semiconductor physics, but uh, an important concept is that if you hit a semiconducting material with light hard enough, you will create or you'll promote an electron to the conduction band. So suddenly, an electron is kicked up and can start moving about, which it normally can't, and it leaves a hole behind. So a hole is just where the electron used to sit. The electron is pulled out and you're left with a positive charge because the electron which was negatively charged is removed. Now imagine we, we have hit our cathode of our battery with light, we create our whole electron. You can imagine how this hole might go to the lithium ion, steal its electron, and push the lithium ion in the electrolyte. At this stage, the hole has disappeared because the hole was just a lack of an electron. It's stolen an electron from the lithium. Um, so lithium plus is in the electrolyte now. And then you can imagine, just like we discussed previously, that the electron goes round and the lithium ion rejoins the electron on the other side. And now we have lithium ion and an electron on the anode, which is the same as a charged battery. So we've gone from discharged uh, the lithium ion on the cathode to charged the lithium ion on the anode. So I'll, I'll come back to this ID with more detailed schematics later on, but that's more or less how lithium ion battery might work. Uh, a light rechargeable battery might work, sorry. And then finally, because before I can start giving some more um, detailed technical discussions, I need to explain how batteries are tested because otherwise you wouldn't understand the graphs I'll show later on. So sorry for these technical slides. But essentially when you charge the battery, you apply a fixed current. So what this graph indicates is that over time you just apply a fixed current to your battery, driving electrons from the cathode to the anode. And then what you do as a battery scientist is you measure how the voltage of your battery increases as you charge it up. And so in the beginning it's discharged, so your voltage is zero, and then after a while it's fully charged and then you stop charging your battery. And then you like to discharge the battery next, and so then you apply just a negative current, which is discharging the battery, and then your voltage drops, as you would expect from a battery that's being discharged all the way back to zero volts. And you can repeat that back and forth. So that's quite simple, but you know, scientists li like to make life difficult, and so we represent these curves in different ways. So this is in red the charge curve, and then in blue the discharge curve. Oftentimes those are mirrored, so you go up and back down. So this is this graph, but then mirrored around the horizontal axis. Or sometimes this uh, curve, the blue curve, is just shifted back so that they overlay like so. And so I'm really sorry about this, but battery scientists use all these different representations um, over each other. And so we'll see some of those later on, but hopefully this helps a little bit to understand what we'll see later. Um, so with that, I want to go now a bit in the history of solar batteries. So I've just introduced the concept of the same material trying to store um, energy and harvest light at the same time. But actually this idea is not new. It was first proposed at the late 70s. And uh, I won't go through all the different papers that have, have been introduced since then. Um, but I just want to say that it's an old idea. I also want to mention that there's two schools of thought here. One school of thought is using three electrode systems, and our school of thought is using two electrode systems. And so I'll discuss those uh, in the following slides. So let's first think about three electrode um, systems, which is not something I engage in myself, uh, but just for completeness. The idea of three electrode systems is oftentimes just to um, slap a solar cell and a battery back to back against each other. So in this um, paper, which is a, a brilliant piece of engineering, um, people have developed a battery here, which is sitting at the back of the solar cell, and the battery and the solar cell are sharing one common metal foil. But for the rest, they are entirely separated. And then people started integrating um, the, the solar cell part of the battery and the energy storage a bit more intimately. In this case, rather than having a metal foil separating the solar cell from the battery, so it's the solar cell, here's the battery, they've made a porous membrane that I, I won't go 
into too much details. Those are three electrode systems. I, I'm just going to focus on more compact, more integrated two electrode systems um, for the rest of this talk. And the first seminal paper on this topic was published back in 1990 uh, by a group of researchers uh, in Japan. And so this is a two electrode system because there's two terminals, there's one here and there in green. And I'll try to help you digest this old schematic, which is a bit complicated, but hopefully it will make sense if I take you through it. So first of all, what's happening here is that light, a photon is sort of, um, is shining on the electrode. On the left hand side you have silicon. Now you know that silicon has a band gap and it's used in a lot of um, 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 solar cells. If you hit silicon with uh, a photon that has enough energy, an electron is promoted to its conduction band. So this is an electron being promoted. It moves up because the higher up in this diagram you are, the more energy you have. And there's a hole left behind. So this is just a lack of an electron in the silicon lattice. So what happens next is that this electron up here is quite unhappy and it wants to sort of combine with something. And what it's presented are silver ions, Ag plus and electrolyte. And so the electron and the silver ion will combine to form silver metal on this surface, right? So you create an electron, it combines with an ion and forms silver metal here. So then the silver ions you are using here are stolen from silver vanadium oxide. It's just a material that's stored on the other side of the, of the battery. And as you steal ions from it, you're left with negative charges, which need to do something. And so these, elect uh, these negative charges, these electrons, are channeled all the way around the circuit and combined with the hole here on this side. So in a nutshell, how this battery works is when you shine light on it, silver metal is formed on one terminal of your battery. And as soon as you release the system, the silver will want to go back to the other side and it will deliver work to do this. And you can see how here when you shine light, the voltage of the battery goes up and it goes back down and goes back up. And uh, that's, that was the state of the art in 1990. Um, so I thought this, uh, Although maybe sil silver ion batteries are a bit expensive and so on, I thought it was a very interesting development back in the days and I was very intrigued why these researchers stopped working suddenly on this very promising technology because maybe this would be an indication as to why I shouldn't develop solar batteries myself. Now, if you put this in perspective, what happened the next year in Japan was that Akira Yoshino um, cracked the last piece of the puzzle needed to make lithium ion batteries commercially viable, which is to develop a, a graphite anode. And so that same year, Sony commercialized a lithium ion battery. Um, so this is Yoshino giving his Nobel Prize talk for the invention of the graphite anode just a couple of years ago. And so the people on this paper all suddenly worked, start working on lithium ion batteries, which was the latest hot thing. And that was this company, which I'd never heard of, Matsushita Electric Industrial, then became Panasonic, which is a company who's making lithium ion batteries for Tesla nowadays. And so all that work that was going in solar batteries was suddenly diverted to lithium ion batteries. And these researchers, unfortunately, were too busy developing lithium ion batteries to keep on working on solar batteries. At least that's what I like to think. Um, good, so then these two terminal batteries disappeared for a long time until in 2017, a team of researchers in France, Italy, and Canada started collaborating on making new types of photo batteries. And what they did is they used the dye, uh, N719. They mixed it with a standard battery cathode material and they hit the system with light. So what happens is that uh, the dye will absorb the energy from the light here. So very much like in the silicon system, you create an electron hole pair. And here they said the hole in the dye will go to the uh, cathode material in your battery, in this case lithium iron phosphate. It will kick the lithium out just like in the previous system and that will help to recharge the battery. 
And then they said, we are not sure what happens with the electrons in this system. They might take part in some side reactions. They didn't know for sure. Um, and to be honest, these systems are really difficult to understand. I'd struggle with them as well. Um, nevertheless, what they saw is that if they shine light for a long time on these batteries, you can see how the potential of the battery goes up, which is an indication of the battery charging. So this paper was published in 2017, and we were very disappointed when this paper was published because at the same time we were working on a competing system, and they beat us to it. So what we were working on was using uh, perovskites, so or organohalide perovskites, which are shown here, which consists of layers of lead iodide separated in this case by cyclohexyl ethylamine, which are sort of polymer groups, and you can get sort of layered materials as shown here. Now you might have heard that perovskites are very popular in sort of next generation solar cells. So they can make very efficient solar cells. And at the time we were trying to use them for battery materials. And so that seemed to be the perfect material to merge uh, photocharging and energy uh, storage together. And so this is what our cells look like. So you had a transparent uh, current collector to let light in. The light hits the perovskite. You create electron hole pairs in your perovskite. And our idea was to trap the holes in the perovskite um, with a layer called PCBM. I won't go into too much details. These holes will kick the lithium out, and the electrons are transported across. And that process corresponds to charging your battery. And sort of this is what the very first device looked like. It's literally held together by clips and blue tack, but um, we were able to entirely discharge the battery, recharge it with light only and then use it to drive an LED, which we were quite uh, pleased with at the time. So you can see the process of the battery. So in yellow um, is, the, uh, is the time, so the first four hours in this case, we hit the battery, we'd like to charge it. Then in dark without light, we attach it to a load, just a resistor in this case, we discharge it. Once it's discharged, you shine light. Again, on it you can see how uh, the voltage goes back up. Um, here's another interesting experiment, which is, um, so we charged a battery, so there's, in, in, and then we apply the same load to the battery. In the green case, we shine light on the battery as it's being discharged, right? And then you can see how over time the voltage stays above the black line, which is the control sample, where we just apply the load without light. So in other words, What's happening here is normally your battery will discharge very quickly, which is a black curve, so the voltage goes down very quickly. But if you shine light while applying this voltage, you can see how um, you keep your battery charged for a longer time. And especially at the end, you can see how the, the voltage stays flat. And actually, at that point, the amount of energy you absorb from sunlight equals the amount of energy used um, by the load and so you would stay on that voltage pretty much forever until your battery falls apart. And now comes the bad news. In the case of um, perovskite materials, these batteries don't last very long. Um, this experiment lasted about one day, so 20 hours, and that's about the end of these devices. Um, here you can see how we um, charge and discharge our battery a number of times, and the width of the gray area here is an indication for how much energy is stored in the battery, right? And you can see how this becomes thinner and thinner and thinner. So the, the, the battery discharges faster and faster and faster. So it's, um, it's similar to your mobile phone, which when you've just bought it, it lasts sort of two days, three days, and then quite quickly, you can only use it for a day at most. And this is the same here. Initially, uh, you have a, uh, the discharge takes a long time, so this is time versus voltage, so it takes a long time to discharge it, a wide gray block, but then over time as you do it more, it becomes shorter and shorter, so it discharges quickly. And uh, we've tried to investigate why it happens that, that these uh, uh, perovskites, whilst you cycle them, they fall apart and form lead metal and, and other nasty stuff. Um, and so we had to... Uh, think about how we might solve this. So the issues we need to solve are the stability of the perovskite, stability of the electrolyte, 
And then I'll talk about some other challenges that have to do with the use of lithium metal alums and come to that in a second. And also the efficiency of these batteries were, was very small. So if you have a solar cell at home on your roof, probably the efficiency is, I don't know, 15% or more. These cells only had 0.03% efficiency, so that's a big, big issue as well. So let's try to see if we can improve this. So first of all, on the efficiency, the stability, sorry, the stability of the perovskites. Um, <coughs> this is the work from uh, Angus, who's sitting in the room, who uh, was very brave and tried to make perovskites more stable. And so what, what he did was, as I just explained, the perovskites we use um, consists of la layers of lead, bromide or lead iodide, with some organic groups in between, and this repeats back and forth. And so what he did is sort of uh, tweak the amount of layers of um, lead bromide you have in the system, so lead iodide, and how much you separate them, and actually can sort of have three of these layers, one, two, three, four, and so on, you can have different spaces. And so he tried pretty much everything, and what these graphs show is that all these systems didn't work. So in each of the cases, you see how these um, discharge curves here are very wide in the beginning, so lots of energy stored, and as you cycle them, next cycle, next cycle, next cycle, this width becomes shorter and shorter, which means that your battery sort of loses its lifetime and dies as you are watching it. So for these things to work, you will need to be able to charge and discharge them more than a thousand times at least with virtually no capacity loss. And here we can see how in the num so after just maybe 50 cycles or so, all the capacity is gone. So then Angus said like, oh, well, there's some interesting electrochemistry going on, on here at high voltages, around two volts. Maybe if we just use the battery in this area, we'll get it stable. And even when we try to use in these sort of narrow voltage windows, um, the battery still fell apart. So that wasn't very good. So then the other challenge we are facing with this particular design is that we are using lithium metal as a counter electrode. So in the beginning of the presentation, I've shown you this uh, cross section of a battery. And how this battery works is that you have graphite particles on the anode side, and then um, layered metal oxides containing lithium on the cathode side. And so what you can do is say, well, uh, I, I will not use invention from the Nobel Prize winner I've just shown a few slides ago. I will not use graphite. Instead, I will just use a thin sheet of lithium metal. And uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll borrow some of that lithium metal, I'll stick it in my cathode, and I'll plate it back there, and I'll stick it back in the cathode, and I'll plate it back there. Which is what we had to do because our contrary to the perovskite has no lithium inherently in there, so you need to take your lithium from somewhere. We took it from lithium metal. Now the problem is if you do that, as you strip and plate your lithium back and forth between the anode and cathode, you inevitably start forming dendrites, and when those cross your cell, they form a short circuit, and that's how batteries catch fire. And you might remember all these stories of the uh, Dreamliner aircrafts catching fire a couple of years ago. It had to do with this kind of um, challenges. Um, similar for Tesla cars exploding sometimes. It's all the same problem. So at this point, we, uh, we decided that probably we were not able to solve the problem with perovskites with lithium metal anodes, and we had to make a more drastic change to our design. And so what we started using was zinc ion batteries rather than lithium ion batteries. Now the nice thing about zinc ion batteries is that you can strip and plate zinc quite easily without forming these nasty dendrites and explosions. Also if you use a zinc ion system, the electrolyte which in, is in between your lithium and your cathode can be aqueous, um, which reduces cost and increases safety. And also there's some advantages with the uh, um, cost of these materials. So I'll come back to that later. So you can see here what the zinc ion battery looks like. It's very similar to a lithium ion battery, except that you just use a piece of zinc metal as an anode, which is very easy and cheap to use, and you use an aqueous electrolyte. And that actually makes our life much easier. And also if you think about the goal of this technology to help fight energy poverty, 
um, the cost of your system is inevitably going to be very important. Now, if you look at this periodic table of element price, you can see that lithium costs about 90 pounds per kilogram, whereas zinc is only 2.2 pounds per kilogram, so it's much cheaper, which is important. And also the um, main elements used on the cathode side, vanadium cost 17 pounds per kilogram, which is what's used for zinc ion batteries, compared to 46 pounds per kilogram for cobalt, which is used in lithium ion batteries. So there's both on sort of the active ion side as the cathode materials use a potential price benefit moving to zinc ions. The price you pay is that you will never get as high of an output voltage using zinc ion batteries. So with the zinc ion battery, you'll get 1 or 1.5 volts at the most output voltage, whereas with lithium ion batteries, you get more than 3 volts. So you lose at least half of the energy density, but you gain in stability and cost. Right. So this is, the, uh, this is our design for zinc ion batteries. <coughs> So the active material in this case is vanadium pentoxide, which is shown in brown here. And so we're going to hit that material with light, just like we've done in the previous schematics. And again, sorry if these diagrams are confusing, but what you do is you promote an electron to its conduction band up here. And then once it's there, you can sort of trick it to sort of go down this waterfall of energy levels and move to the zinc metal side. At the same time, the hole that's left behind here will expel zinc from the vanadium oxide, and then that zinc ion travels to the zinc metal where it recombines with the electron to form zinc metal. Um, I'll maybe explain that one more time. So to charge this, what you need to do is drive zinc out of this material and plate it on the zinc metal. And so how we do it is we hit the vanadium oxide with light, an electron is generated. The electrons like to sort of travel down this energy waterfall they travel to the zinc, and the holes can't go across this barrier here, created by P3HT. It kicks, as a result, zinc ion out, and that recombines on the other side here. Good. So this schematic is a bit confusing. So just to make sure that it works that way, what we've done is we first made photodetectors. So in the photodetector, we make a stack of all these materials, and then we shine light on the photodetector. And when you shine light, in this case, the current from a photodetector increases, and when it's dark, it decreases. And so if we stack the materials right in the order shown here, so we have vanadium pentoxide, then p 3 h then RGO, then carbon felt. If you stack this material in just the right order, uh, you can get a high current response. If you put them in this order, so the exact same materials, but not in the right order, you get just noise in the system. So it's really showing that this sort of waterfall of energy levels the different materials stacked on top of each other is important to get photo batteries working. Now, as you'll remember from a few slides ago, the way battery scientists like to test their batteries is to first charge them. So you drive a current in the system and you look at how the voltage increase of your battery and then you uh, discharge it. So you jump from here to there and then you discharge it. Sorry if these graphs are a bit com uh, confusing. The thing to pay attention to is in gray is a graph of what happens when you discharge or charge your battery in the dark, so in dark conditions. And what you'll see is that when you shine light, this graph shifts to the right. And so what does this shift to the right mean? Well, if you look at the axis, on the vertical axis, we have the voltage output of the battery. And on the horizontal axis, we have the amount of capacity, so the amount of energy stored per weight of your battery in this case. And so what you see is that for the exact same material, the exact same battery, is when you shine light, suddenly you can pull out twice as much energy from the same system. So that's a clear indication that your battery is sort of doing something uh, useful. So then one of the things you, were, you have to note is that when you do this very slowly, so here we are discharging our battery with a very low current, 50 milliamps per gram, you get a lot of light enhancement. <coughs> If you discharge your battery very quickly, in this case, one amp per gram, there's very little enhancement in um, energy. And maybe that makes sense, because if you discharge something very quickly, light doesn't have enough time to generate lots of electron hole pairs in your battery. So um, these batteries sort of have 
different enhancements depending on how quickly you charge and discharge them. So also with these batteries, what you can do is you can charge them with light here. So the battery is discharged to zero volt. You shine light on it, you charge it to, in this case, almost one volt. And then if you discharge it in the dark, you would follow this curve. So you can see how over time the voltage decreases, as you would expect when you discharge a battery. Now, if you shine light on these photo batteries while you are discharging them, you can see how the voltage stays much higher. So in other words, you are charging a battery at the same time as you're discharging it. But then when you turn the light off, you suddenly discharge the battery very quickly. So in terms of stability, what we've done here is we've charged and discharged our battery 500 times. You can see how the sort of uh, capacity or the amount of energy you can uh, store in your battery, shown in black here, is wiggling a bit in the beginning, but then it stabilizes and from cycle 150 onwards, it stays just flat. So compared to the perovskite materials we were discussing earlier, which died after 10 cycles, we've made quite some progress here. And the efficiency of energy conversion, which was 0 0.06 in the previous system, has now increased to 1.2%, which is quite an improvement in just two years' time. Right, so we've then tried to uh, develop a couple of different material chemistries that can achieve the um, light charging effect in a battery that I just described, um, mainly with the idea to make the system as simple as possible. So in the previous battery, you'll remember that there was quite a few different layers stacked on top of each other. In this case, there's only three layers. There's vanadium dioxide, reduced graphene oxide, and carbon felt, so three layers on top of each other. Um, but you can see that we still get this sort of interesting um, energy landscape where the electrons that are generated in vanadium dioxide, just like in the previous um, slide, travel down this energy landscape and are moved across to the zinc to recombine and plate um, zinc metal. So this is a picture of the active material, the uh, vanadium dioxide using these batteries. And here again, you can see how a battery will discharge in the dark and then with light, it's enhanced. And these batteries, interestingly, uh, the faster you charge them, the more enhancement you have, which I'm not sure in how much detail I should do, go. It's uh, the opposite of the previous battery and that has to do with improvements in impedance of the battery probably. Great, and again, these materials are quite stable. So we cycle them for 1,000 um, charges and discharges. So that would be sort of three, three years of use in practice. You can see how they retain their capacity quite nicely. Good, so then we also looked at uh, capacitors rather than batteries. And it turns out that you can use the exact same trick for capacitors. And so here we use a material called um, uh, graffiti carbon nitride as the active material for the capacitors. And you can charge and discharge them with light, uh, maybe go a bit faster. You can make capacitors with vanadium pentoxide as well, and those work beautifully as well. So I think we've come to a point where we have to ask ourselves the question whether the materials we've developed and the cells we've developed um, make any sense at all to solve the pressing issues I was talking about at the beginning of today's presentation. So what we are looking at here are energy poverty requirements analyzed per different tiers. Uh, so these are tables that are used by um, charities trying to help people um, living in energy poverty. And so what, what, what you see here are different tiers. So tier zero people have no energy whatsoever. And then you try to supply them with tier one energy supplies, which is sort of just enough to provide some light inside the house. And so you can see that typically what they aim for is de de delivering at least three watts of energy uh, for four hours in total of which one hour at night. And then the step up from there is tier two, where you can sort of just about sort of um, charge your phone, uh, watch television, and so on. And for that you need 50 watts for minimum, and people would want it at least four hours a day with two hours at night. So these kind of tables are very useful uh, when you try to develop a solar battery because now suddenly you know that, oh, you need to be able to store your energy for two hours at night and so on and so forth. And as you go up these stairs, it becomes harder and harder 
to supply that energy. So the, what I've then done is done some back of the uh, envelope calculations. So my assumptions to sort of look at what efficiencies we need to achieve um, is that uh, we would use a one square meter panel per household. So about this big for one household, which seemed reasonable. I assume that our batteries would deliver an output voltage of one volt, which is what you saw in the previous slides. It would have a certain specific capacity, which is sort of based on the measurements I've just shown. And then the, the place I'm looking at is sort of, I'm, I'm working with a colleague at IIT Jodhpur in India, and they have about six kilowatt hours per day of sunlight, and sort of that's what I'm aiming to work with. And then if you want to supply tier one energy, we only need 0.2% efficiency. And we are already above that level. And sort of, we are not quite achieving 3% yet, but we are hopeful that we'll be able to reach that quite soon, actually. Now, what is more challenging than I expected was to be able to store enough energy in the battery that goes with the solar cell. So in other words, sort of getting the efficiency right is okay, but then storing all that energy is more difficult. And so I'll try to explain that in the next slide. So this is at the bottom here, I've calculated how many milligrams of battery we need per square centimeter to store the, this energy at night. Um, so the problem is, if you're only storing a little bit of energy, so tier one energy poverty, having just 1.2 milligrams of battery material per square centimeter is enough. If you want to go to tier two, you need to store 40 milligrams per square centimeter. And the problem with that is that your battery electrode gets thicker and thicker. So tier one, maybe the electrode is quite thin, right? So there's only 1.2 milligrams per square centimeter. In which case, the ions and electrons travel quite happily back and forth in your electrode, there's no problem. If you want to store 40 milligrams per square centimeter, your electrode needs to be quite thick, sort of, I mean, it's 200 microns or so, which to you might sound like, you know, it's three hairs thick, uh, but for battery scientists, that's really thick. And so you'll, you'll struggle shuttling your ions back and forth. And also, imagine light is coming from the top, if it's a thin electrode, light will go throughout your electrode and illuminate all the particles. If it's a very thick electrode, light will be absorbed in top layer and all the rest will be dead and will not be active. And so that's a very big challenge as well. So what we are trying to do is to um, go towards structured electrodes um, where instead of having a flat electrode that's very thick and light can't go in, is to maybe stretch your electrode in sort of these honeycomb lattices where light can easily go in. So you can store a lot of energy by going higher in thickness, but still you light, allow for light to travel back and forth in your electrodes. And also you maybe work on the transport of electrons, which we did, in this case we achieved by uh, using carbon nanotubes, sort of very highly conductive fibers that stick out vertically in your electrodes so that the electrons can travel nicely back and forth, so they are not uh, limited by the thickness of the electrode. And we also allow for light to go in nicely. And so that's a, that's a big fabrication challenge. And sort of we are starting to be able to make those structured electrodes quite nicely for just lithium ion batteries, which is shown here. And so we coat the, the honeycombs, which is the backbone, to allow for both electron transport, but also for light to go in and, and out. We can coat these surfaces with nanoparticles to store lithium ion. And we've tested a lithium ion battery, but not yet in a photo battery. So that would be future research. I also want to talk about future work needed to scale this up to a practical level. So I've shown you previously the picture of the first photo battery from the lab, which was blue tagged and held with clips together. Sort of since then, what we've done is we've made nice little button coin cells in which we've drilled holes and mounted a uh, window so that light can go in. And uh, um, about a year or two ago, we started working on these much larger pouch format cells. And so um, what you're look, looking at here is sort of this your silvery bit is sort of the casing, the encapsulation of your battery. And then here, the black part is where we mounted the window so that light can go directly in and charge your battery. And so this is about eight by eight centimeters um, large. Now, obviously, if you want to save lives, I was talking about panels that are one by one meter large. And so we need to be able 
to scale that fabrication process up quite dramatically. And sort of well, what's a, a fortunate coincidence is that a lot of um, uh, solar panels as well as batteries are made on the same manufacturing platform, which is called roll-to-roll -roll coating. And so typically what you do is you have a long foil and you coat it continuously with your active material. And either you do it for photoactive material, if you're making a cell, or you coat it with battery materials. But the process is the same uh, used by both um, communities. And so this is a schematic cross-section of what these machines look like. You have a stock of foil, which you unwind and tension. Then you just cast a slurry. So this is a picture of slurry we use for batteries. You just drop cast it on top. You dry your slurry, and then you rewind your electrode. And so this is the machine we are using in our lab to make those. And so this is an example of a run of 35 meters of battery electrodes. And so we've done this for batteries. We've not done this for photo batteries yet. But we are quite hopeful that this is the right manufacturing platform to be able to start working towards the scales needed if you want to make a difference um, in, in sort of energy poverty and the other applications I've talked about um, today. So I've just a few minutes left uh, on the presentation, so I'll give a quick summary. So we've seen how we've come a long way from trying to harvest sun's light and store it, starting in the 19th century with the solar troughs and storing energy as steam in sort of pressure vessels, to in 1990 this nice um, silver ion battery which was able to recharge by light, and sort of then the work we are doing currently on zinc ion batteries. Um, there's, a, however, still a very long way to go, as I emphasized. I think if you want the solar batteries to really make an impact, we need to gain higher efficiency. So I think we have to increase our efficiency with at least a factor three. And the way we want to achieve this is by having more sophisticated charge transport layers, sort of the way we stack our layers and manufacture them. As I mentioned, the really high challenge is to get enough material stacked on top of each other while still letting light in the electrode. And that's an engineering challenge where we need to structure the geometry of the electrode. And then we need to do that in a way that's compatible with these large scale up manufacturing processes. And that's quite a challenge in itself as well. Then I think we need to do some more financial calculation and life cycle analysis to make sure this all makes sense. But then it's looking promising, like we might be able to target tier two and tier three energy poverty targets. And for that, I'm in touch with a, a collaborator at IIT Jodhpur with whom I'm hoping to uh, start doing some field tests to see if the batteries we are developing can actually withstand the hot temperatures that would be exposed to in the sun and sun in their solar farms. So the longest road, but um, we've already made quite some progress in the past years, and so I hope we'll be able to take some of these technologies forward. So then very importantly, oh, it was jumping over the most important slide, which is thanking the people who are actually doing the work. So this is my research team. Uh, not everyone is working on photo batteries, so the people circled in green here are in order Byungman, Angus, Arvind, and Lee Foot. So those are people doing the hard work in the lab. I also want to acknowledge two alumni from my group um, Shah Bahnat, who did the very first perovskite, made the very first perovskite batteries, is now a professor at IIT Jodhpur. And then uh, Buddha Dekaborwa was the person uh, starting to work on the zinc ion batteries. And he just got a lectureship at UCL in London, so he's doing very well as well. So, but they, uh, they, they did all the experimental work. And then finally, I would like to thank the Royal Society, the ERC, and the EPSRC for funding the research, and of course, all of you for your attention. So thank you for coming out tonight.